Hi, Dr. Hamilton here. Welcome back to the Epigenetic Performance Series. Today, I am always excited, right? But today I'm super excited. It's rare for me to get the gift that I'm getting today. Uh, I have Diane Hoffman with me today and Diane's a badass, right? That's, that's the number one thing that I'm gonna say about her. And I'm the reason I'm so excited is because she's like me, right? We both spent our um, really powerful years and we're still in them, um, but our powerful years in, in service to military and law enforcement. And so, uh, Diane, welcome. Diane is, it was an undercover San Diego police officer and, uh, she also did patrol and things like that, but the cool stuff is the undercover stuff. And, um, you know, in, in a turn of events, Diane, uh, really kind of destroyed her gun hand and was medically retired from the police force. And so she pivoted as she does well and created her own company and it's called Spa Life. And it's, it's interesting and Diane's gonna describe this to you, but it's seek power always. And you know, one of her signature kind of phrases is that true power doesn't exist outside of us that you are your own power. And so today, Diane's gonna share with us the transition of state for her and how it informed her new creation. She's also going to share some really powerful system strategies for you to be anti-fragile and for you to, to actually choose the new expression you would like to design in this interesting scenario that we're in. So Diane, welcome, thank you. Uh, tell us more about yourself. Uh, well, first, thank you so much, Micra, for having me here on your show. And I love these kind of conversations because it really allows us to have opportunities to have outside of the box conversations. Mm -hmm. How can we approach things different? I like looking at, you know, what's happening in the world and what kind of anti-cultural thing that we need to do that's different that allows us to pivot stronger. So um, for me, as you had shared, you know, I was with the San Diego Police Department and, you know, I think we're on certain paths where we're moving forward. I didn't grow up saying, hey, I want to be a cop. You know, it's something that, uh, you know, I evolved into, uh, you know, going to college. I had a degree in criminal justice and I thought I was going to be an attorney and decided that that wasn't for me. And so I was the only woman on my squad. Uh, at the time, we, there was a serial killer series going on. Uh, and they needed to have women officers to pose as prostitutes because we were on the hunt for that uh, serial killer who was targeting prostitutes. And so it really, you know, I went from private school and having no idea what was happening on the street to really being thrown into an element that I really had to reinvent myself and how I was showing up. And I think that this is something that is so great for the listeners is to really look at where the point in your life where you're having to reinvent yourself all the time. Mm -hmm. And right now is, is a perfect example of this is now, you know, the, the 2.0, the 3.0 version of how we're going to show up in our world. And so really building those, um, skills that make us gritty, that make us resilient, that has us really look at the face of what's going on. I mean, with your service and work, you know, I love first responders and people who, when things blow up, that they are actually running towards it. Because <laughs> we are actually moving through the fear and the chaos and the insanity because we know that we're coming out stronger on the other end. And, and of course, it, it sounds like you've had several opportunities to, um, to kind of hone that anti-fragile skill set. You know, I wonder what, what, what did you bump into as you were preparing yourself to go undercover in, in a serial killer case? I mean, who does that, right? Except somebody on TV <laughs> and you. Um, what, what, what types of things did you bump into? Well, you know, it's interesting. There's a, there's a lot of practical things in terms of uh, your language for one, right? Mm -hmm. There was, that was a big shift in, in coming into like some street language, some harshness, like some not, not very feminine ways of being, but then also as a prostitute, you had to also be very feminine. So there was such mm -hmm. a mix of how you were showing up. And one of the things that really um, came so strong for me in undercover work is to be ultra aware of your surroundings, that mm. the smallest nuance that was happening around you was a trigger, not for fear, uh, because I you really resort to your training. So you can actually train yourself to respond 
in fears in a way so that you're not reacting uh, in a situation that is uh, making things dangerous for you or yourself. So when you actually start noticing and trusting yourself, this became a time where I really started trusting my intuition on a deeper level because sometimes I would trigger somebody who drove by in a car and I didn't have like the specific articulation of what was going on, but everything in me was like, there's a problem with that person. Mm -hmm. There's something with that person. And I really learned that it became a life or death situation mm -hmm. to be able to trust those things. Um, those have saved me time and time again, when I've had guns pulled on me that I've walked during an alley, I've had somebody, you know, pop out, you know, fights and things that have gone on, just trusting that inner knowing that that is always going to move you to the next step. Wow. You talk about um, fine tuning your intuition under pressure. Yeah. My goodness. Right. So when you, when you shattered your gun hand and now all of this, all, all of this that you've known that you've gotten so good at is, is no longer available to you because I know they medically retired you and, and basically you didn't have a choice. Um, how did you enter that phase and how quickly did you, did you pop out into your next new expression? Right. Well, well, great question. I think the first uh, phase, if you will, is just kind of shock you know, because you think like, hey, you're on this path. You know, I'm in the best shape of my life. I'm actually able to support, you know, my daughters. Like things are starting to really, you know, click into place. Mm -hmm. And I think that there was, uh, you know, there was some you know, disbelief and some anger at first, because it was like, really, I'm like getting shot at every day. And this is what's going to take me out is shattering my gun hand. Like it feels like something you should just be able to pop out and, and come out on the other side of. And so then I really started looking at what were some of the things as I was transitioning out that people were asking of me. And even when I was on the department, people would ask me to um, help look at how they were living their life because I could always juggle multiple things. Mm -hmm. uh, they were looking at uh, how I created my space, the systems I used, the structures I used. And because I had been in thousands of homes over the years on the police department, I could see what were some of the environments and some of the actions and the, and the mindsets and the ways people were being that actually had the police be called in the first place. Right. And so I created something called the clutter to drama ratio, that the more clutter that was in somebody's space, the more drama they had and the more police that would show up in their day to life. And, you know, you don't have to have the police necessarily be called to your home to not feel that sense of chaos in your life. And sometimes it's literally your physical space. I mean, I created my first online academy with that called Clutter to Calm, where it was actually clearing the things in your space, because that is ground one, is that if you've got a chaotic space, you've got a chaotic mind, you can't make clear <laughs> decisions. I mean, it all, you know, ramps into each other with that. And so that allowed me to start looking at, okay, the skills that I've learned here, they're not just police skills, they're life skills. It's a way of being. It's how you can show up and have the confidence to move through things, even if you don't know exactly what it's going to look like. I mean, I've had times where I've been working with a client. This is so funny. I had one person who heard me on, on a, another podcast and he called me from another country and said, I'm being led for you to be my, my spiritual teacher. And I was like in my head going, I've not been a spiritual teacher. I don't have the training for that. How am I going to do that? And everything about me listening to my intuition was like, yeah, you're supposed to be that for that person. And we would get on some calls and I just had some insights and life things that just came through me that I just spoke to him about. And it was just taking all of my life experience and being able to translate it in a way that he needed to hear in that moment. And he was like, this has changed my life. And it was like, this is what we're all supposed to do is take all the experience of, of what we're up to, listen to those things. And it absolutely helps uh, the people on their path and what they're doing. And that's what led me move into, you know, spa life, trusting my own intuition, uh, really consulting with people to not second guess themselves, to move through crisis and to be the kind of leader that even when they're faced with something that there's always a way to move through it and to pivot and to, to really make that bigger difference. 
And, you know, I love that. I love, I love so many things that you've just opened up for us. And so I'd like to, I'd like to go a little, a little more into a couple of them. You know, we, we work with environmental design a lot because, you know, as you pointed out, if, if there's clutter in your space, there's clutter in your mind. Right. And, and people, people sometimes go, that doesn't make any sense. I don't care about my stuff laying on the floor or all of this stuff everywhere. I know where my stuff is. Right. But when, when somebody says that to you and, and we all know that it makes a difference, right? There's no question that makes a difference. If somebody says that to you, how do you kind of pop open that lens of perception that's, that's simply justification? Do you have any clever ways to get somebody to look at that process differently? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think one of the first things to look at is what what is clutter and what does it actually represent? Just like when people have extra weight on their body, it's a mm -hmm. form of protection. Clutter is also a form of protection. It's layers that you're building up externally in your space that subconsciously you're actually hiding from the world. Huh. It's actually a barrier that you are keeping from yourself and other people because if there's always clutter happening around you, there's always a distraction. Even if, <clears throat> excuse me, if you don't recognize it um, consciously, subconsciously, you can just be pulled about there's always something else to be done, to be focused on. There's never completion. There's all these open loops that happen. And so having just a simple awareness that uh, clutter in your space is an open loop and mm -hmm. that you're asking questions, not like, you know, should I keep this uh, or will I use this someday? Because you can always say, oh, I can always use this someday. You need to ask some deeper questions is that is what's in my space the things that are actually going to move me forward to the next expression of who I'm going to be? Mm. Oh, God, I love that. That so is <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is a very much a, a deeper philosophical question question of what are we creating in our space that actually is the building box that allow us to build the next iteration of ourself, of the next way that we are showing up for the people we're here to serve, to the next iteration of who we're being uh, you know, globally. I mean, I love one of the things that's happening right now is in this global reset is that we are now being invited to shake up. We actually talk about the chaos, right? The chaos in your life everything around us that we thought was predictable, that we could do, that we took for granted, all of those things are being shaken up. And how we respond to that and how we actually look at that is going to determine how well we're going to actually move through that. And, you know, you mentioned when we were speaking earlier this week that, you know, you're watching that, that of, of course, the typical lens of duality that we function in of the polarization of extreme fear, paranoia, you know, and also this empowering lens of, I am so excited. I get to create the next new whatever, right? Whether it's me or my processes or, um, do you have uh, strategies that someone who who may be sitting all the way to the end of fear right now because it's fearful for many, even even more towards the middle, do you have strategies that you can move them along the curve so that they're not as entrenched in the density of that fear? Right, right. Well, great question. I would say that the first thing to say is that the only thing you actually have control over is yourself. Mm. And so when you start with that and you start seeing, okay, where am I? And there's actually kind of three different places we can show up. There is our our public life, where this is what we're letting everyone else see. This is, you know, the reflection of what, you know, uh, maybe we're standing in our business or, or who we are as a world leader or who we are as a, as a neighbor, a mom, whatever that is. It's like what we're showing the world. And then there's our private life, which is what we're showing our immediate family, maybe some of our close friends, you know, they get to know a little bit more of those insights of us. And then there is our undercover life. And that is the part that we hope that no one actually knows or hears about who we are. <laughs> and that's where a lot of the fear lies is that if we, God forbid, get found out that there's these things that happen in our life that we're going to be thought of as a fraud, we're not going to be good enough, people aren't going to choose us, uh, we're not going to make it. I mean, all of these things that can really um, take us out of the game. And so when you're realizing that this is where you're at, it's actually very powerful to actually share a part of you that you haven't been willing to share before. I mean, we talk about being vulnerable as a you know reflection of being uh, resilient and really 
uh, being out there in the world. And so to whether it's with a mentor or a trusted friend is to when you share those aspects of yourself, you are then expo exposing that so that you can actually see yourself in a different light, which instead of taking power away from you, it actually empowers you because you're using all of yourself. Because as the parts that we think are maybe a shameful aspect are actually the parts that we now can have the, the tools to actually do something more about. Now, an example of this is when I was a police officer, I was in um, a very disempowering relationship, one that I, um, I didn't trust myself. I uh, was always second guessing myself and I could show up as a strong police officer and do my work out there and help other people. But in my own situation, I had my own undercover that was going on that um, I was trying to keep, you know, my family unit together. I was really um, not speaking my own truth. Mm -hmm. And so, and I never wanted to talk about that. I never wanted to share about that because I thought it would show that um, I wasn't a leader, that I was weak, that I didn't trust myself. Right. But the fact that I went through that and I can recognize that and now actually say that out loud, it actually allows me to be that much stronger because one, that can't be used against me because I'm owning every aspect about myself. And by utilizing that, I also had the tools that moved me through that. And that had to do with, uh, you know, sharing that first with other people. Um, I was involved in a very notorious uh, kidnapping murder case that there was something bigger than myself that also allowed me to move through that as well. Mm -hmm. So we look at what are the things happening with ourselves that we're not sharing that we can go, what, what are the lessons out of that? How did I move through that? Because anything that we use as our own strategies can turn around and be used for someone else. So where does the, where is the line of between vulnerability and and kind of more of a victim sharing where where there's kind of shame involved and you're and and it's it's icky, right? Yeah. Is is there a line there and then and if there is that line there, what is the ideal way for someone to share in vulnerability without crossing that line? Right. This is a, a brilliant distinction because there is, uh, you know, everyone can have a victim experience, right? But you choose to actually identify yourself as a victim. Mm -hmm. And that's where the distinction comes is that, you know, we all have things that are disempowering that we may feel shameful about. And we look at, okay, how can we learn from this, grow from this? You know, there's many different people we can reach out to to shift that. If you have a victim experience and you can move through that, you can actually utilize that as an anchor to support other people and have it be part of your own toolbox to support people. Mm -hmm. If you are identifying yourself as a victim, that is low level energy. You're actually staying in that in that space. You're staying undercover when you're in that place because of that shame. You're not sharing it. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's a matter of being stuck in that and not actually um moving through it, kind of that failing forward versus actually um, utilizing the energy of that, that actually becomes part of your power is that you can own it and then shift it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, and that's a great distinction. I, did, I wasn't even thinking that they were actually still staying in victim and that's, and that is the difference. Now um, you, you were talking to me about nine, nine really um, wonderful pieces of wisdom for people to really empower themselves to, to stand up bigger, to create, you know, uh, in more of their conscious creatorship. Could you share some of those with us? Yeah, absolutely. When, um, in fact, these are one of those things when I retired from the police department, I was part of a pilot project led by uh, Jim Bunch uh, called The Ultimate Game of Life. And it was about building your life on what made you happy first, then healthy, then wealthy. And it was built on the uh, foundations of Thomas Leonard about you have all these different environments and different things that you can actually pull from to actually make choices about how you're going to live your life. Mm. That It's not like uh, you're focusing on just one area. You have to look at um, how it's affecting everything else. So for instance, if we're at choice, right, and we, we talked about in the beginning, the only thing we have control of is ourself, is that we want to look to these different nine environments to see like, okay, where, what is our best version in that? And what's it going to look like? So one of them is your relationships, right? And the first thing is you look at what's the relationship with yourself, 
who is it that you want to have in your space? I mean, we've talked about that, you know, we become the sum total of the people that we spend time with. So we get to actually be in choice. And I utilized that environment when I was in that disempowering relationship going, okay, this is not the kind of person that's a good example to my daughters. That's going to move me forward in my life. And so this is someone that needs to not be in my life. So utilizing the relationships as part of that. Um, finances is another, you know, environment to look at, you know, what is it that, um, what, how can you be powerful in your finances? Uh, and, you know, I like to use things where I have certain parts that I, I give and tithe in a certain area. I save, I play, you know, I, you know, empower, you know, the, in my business, uh, I like to give certain things away. I mean, really being clear about how are you using the environment of, of money and resources to make a difference in the world? Uh, you also look at uh, your self-care. You know, your self-care is such an important thing. We know we need to fill ourselves up. And, you know, this is a great time right now when people can really start shifting. Uh, you and I have talked about sleep and what that looks like in terms of having the clarity. So we have all of these opportunities to look at these different aspects in our life. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about our physical space and, and whether that has clutter in it or calm. You know, our body is, you know, this is an opportunity for us to really check in. What I'll just talk about your immunity system. You know, what is on a scale of one to 10, what is your immunity? You know, you and I talked about we're like a 12 in our immunity because <laughs> we've made it such a focus and real. You can search out the tools anywhere to be like, okay, I'm seeing people run out of the stores with things. Are you seeing people who are getting like um, fresh whole foods and clean things or people who are walking out with, you know, cigarettes and alcohol, you know, yeah. it's like, what are you actually fortifying yourself for? And these are all environments and these are all choices that we are looking at to see what are some of the differences um, that we can actually make. Um, one of the environments is nature. You know, you talked about going out and going for a walk here when we're done. I mean, we have so many opportunities to um, be at choice with uh, all of our different environments and how they interact together and to see those are all resilient qualities to when you're at choice to say, OK, in this environment, I'm going to choose this because it actually elevates who I'm being and, you know, with myself, with the people I choose to be with and as part of my bigger mission. When you ask yourself from that place you're going to elevate much bigger and be much more stronger in your power because you've consciously chosen. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, this is, this is uh, complex systems 101, right? This is right now to me, one of the most important things that anyone listening can really send your focus to when you take your mind and you look at everything through multidimensional lenses, of complex systems, how they interrelate, how they interconnect, you begin to see a very different picture. It's a picture of epigenetics and how nature and nurture interact because every single thing that you experience is creating an outcome at the cellular molecular right, DNA level. And if we can really truly internalize that, then it simply becomes effortless to live a life. You don't have to think about, oh my God, I've got all of these 50,000 things I've got to do in nine categories. No, you live intuitively because you don't need lists and you don't need to go do research because you know what you need, right? Right. Absolutely. And, you know, you look at, you know, what is your relationship to it? So a lot of, you know, as first responders, we always look at, okay, what's the plan? Right. And how are we going to react? And so many times, you know, even when we've had conversations around this, we don't even necessarily think about it because it's automatic, because we've already pre thought what kind of ways we're going to operate and to be able to shift in the world and, and what that is actually going to look like. So, for instance, for the listeners who are in that place of like extreme fear. You know, I invite you to just be in that, be in that for like one minute where you're just in complete fear and then start writing down what's worst case scenario. Like what would be the worst thing that could possibly happen and write that down. And then let's say that that actually happened. So then what would you actually do? You can actually deconstruct that and say, okay, mm -hmm. if I lost my job, if I lost my home, if, you know, I couldn't find my children, if we were on, you know, lockdown and, and there was no internet and like, you know, all of these things happened. If you actually actually thought about that out loud is that you can then start going, okay, what is your plan from that? 
right? What is your now your resiliency plan? What is it that you're going to move through? Uh, You know, when we went through some of those checklist things for us, you know, we did some things like we got some more water in our home. We Mm -hmm. made sure that uh, we had our generator that was set up. We have like what we call go back, you know, if we need to leave the home and we need to, you know, get on the road, you know, there's just certain things where it's not from a when you know what is the possibility and you have a plan of how you're going to react to that, it takes the sting out of the fear. And from the fear, it actually comes into a place where you can actually be um, prepared and fierce. And you can start looking at all the energy that that happens, that you can actually start bound being smart about it. And this is where I feel like this reemergence of common sense, hopefully is going to be actually coming where people aren't, watching the news for 24 hours a day and the sky is falling and all these crazy things. Okay. Some of you can believe that, but how can you come from this place of strength and a leader and be like, okay, what am I going to be doing? Because when you're confident and you have a plan and you know what you're going to do, just that energy alone, whether or not you're working with clients or not, is going to ripple in the world that people are going to be like, okay, yeah, some craziness may be happening, but how can I be that calm person in the storm to actually lead people to make better choices? And, you know, I think um, you you pointing it out in this way has shown me something that's quite fascinating. I've always been this way, but I also just finished 30 years in the military and we did that all the time. We did it all the time. We had scenario after scenario and, and strategy after strategy that, that, you know, we were trying to cover all the bases in case any of them happened. And so I've just always looked through that lens. My children were brought up through that lens. You know, we had bags in every car and we've always had them because it's common sense, right? (laughs) To have what you need in case you get stuck somewhere, you know, like some people have their iPads, right? Um, But, you know, even, even carrying glass water into the car, glass water bottles, not plastic, because that's not good for the system. Um, But, you know, just to have that in case you end up stranded somewhere waiting for somebody to come and help whatever right Right. um, that 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 ability to just go and and what if that happened and what if that happened and what if and and keep going right because we have the capacity to completely care for ourselves in any situation any and every situation and and when we know that and we trust that we will find people who will assist us. They simply show up. This is what people say, angels, right? Oh, that angel came and saved me. Well, maybe so. But when you know that you're going to get assistance, the assistance always shows up. Absolutely. And so it's also right, developing that trust of, of all of this experience. Because, you know, I love Rumi's quote where it says, you know, act as if the universe is rigged in your favor. Because Absolutely. it is right. I, I just yeah. so love that. What other what other uh, pieces of wisdom are you going to share with us? I'm so loving this conversation. <laughs> right. Well, you know, it, it's uh, one of the things that I always uh, share a lot of times with my clients is that, like, let's just say you're driving in your car and then you just like pull off to the side of the road and you just stop. And something happened, like you can't get back to your house. You don't know what's happening. You know, what is, what do you have contained in that space? Like you had talked about having water in your car. Do you have snacks? You know, we have like an extra blanket in our car. You know, we have a flashlight, you know, we have a change of clothes that's in our car, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just having like these, just think about like, if you were going away for a weekend, do you have those things with you? And I'm not talking excess and be crazy. You don't have to build a bomb shelter, right? (laughs) But I'm talking just some basic things to be able to just have to have that peace of mind because anything that you have that's part of a peace of mind is something that will support you. Um, When you talked about having like a plan for your kids, I remember um, when I was working patrol, there was a, uh, because I also worked a lot with gangs and there was something called the get down series where gangs were coming into grocery stores and with AKs shooting up and having everybody go down. Well, I actually did a training with my daughters where I said, okay, if we're in the store and I just say go, you go to the cereal aisle because they had bigger containers there. You pull out a cereal, you go behind them and only I get you back out. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know a lot of people thought I was nuts training my kids, some of these things, but you know, (laughs) both of my daughters have had situations where they either needed to know some Mm self-defense, they needed to have some confidence that they knew what to do. And 
it actually reduced their fear mm -hmm. to actually have some knowledge around that. So another thing is, uh, you know, now that people are at home, you can actually do it on YouTube, but, you know, learn a few self-defense skills, right? Because there's something about knowing what to do in a situation. Um, even if you never have to use it, it will change how you show up. And that was one of the shifts that really happened when I was working patrol is, you know, because I, you know, this is a whole nother story, but I basically worked alone a lot in patrol uh, because at the time I was the only woman on my squad and a lot of the wives didn't want me driving with their husbands. So I became what was called a John unit where I drove alone in my police car. Um, there's, that's a whole nother thing about <laughs> having women having your back, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Um, but we've evolved in that. Now we are actually, you and I have talked about, we've created uh, cultures of women supporting women. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of that comes from our experience of, of not having that. Uh, and so one of the things is that, you know, many nights I would walk, you know, two, three in the morning down alleys mm -hmm. by myself, not knowing who's going to pop out at any time and having to work through these scenarios of what would I do? How do I react? What do I say? Mm -hmm. What does that look like? And just when you're in that place of being prepared, and I'm not saying, you know, that's a worst case scenario for work that we did. But if you just look in day-to-day -day life, what is your worst case scenario? What, what would trigger fear for you or for your family? And when you just, even if you just think about what you would do, you're that much, that much a step ahead to yeah. actually be able to do it with a, a piece of, you know, a frame of, of reference where you're actually calm. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of people in our neighborhoods, we've been evacu evacuated because of fires, right? Mm -hmm. So I actually have a checklist, an emergency checklist on my phone that says when, when something goes down, these are the six things that, that I do. Mm -hmm. You know, we have uh, family safe words, you know, so that if somebody needs to pick up the kids from somewhere, you know, my grandkids know the fa family safe code. So if you can't go back to your home because of something happening, where's your family going to meet? So we have a place like, hey, if we need to go south, we go to my parents. If we, you know, go north, we're going to my sisters. It's like just having these kind of conversations allows you to just be clear Let's say you don't have the internet and you don't have access to things. What is your family plan? And if you just speak through that, you're coming from such a more powerful place that you can actually be that leader to move people through crisis situations. And, you know, it's it's so interesting for, for anybody who's listening, who says, yeah, you know, I, I don't see that happening to me. I don't need that. You know, I, um, what showed me that, that belief system was limiting in me, right? I'd been military for very long. And one of the operators, I, I had to learn self-defense. And one of the operators basically took me down and got me in a position that there was not one chance on the planet that I could extricate myself from that. And he said, now, ma'am, I, I can do anything I want to you. And I said, oh, huh, okay. That's not a good position for me to be in. My mind told me I would never be in that position, but when I actually got in it, there was no question that he was spot on. And I have to say, I, I got very serious about those basic things. And I, I love to tell women and children, especially boys, girls, both, right? Why don't we do common sense training? Right. It's not, it's not self-defense, it's common sense. Absolutely. <laughs> right. Yeah. Of being a human who might potentially get into a situation someday that isn't ideal. I mean, right. not to live in fear of it, but right to be prepared for it. And, you know, and you, you give me such comfort because I can't tell you the number of moms and also dads who always looked at me like I was crazy for preparing my children for like we had chemical spills where we used to live and and i would tell them if the school gets locked down you will leave immediately and you will do this right yes. and 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 that went against what the popular opinion was of being locked down in that school where they didn't have the respiratory respiratory mechanisms to keep my children safe right oh, and yeah. so i love i love hearing another mother <laughs> Of course, saying saying the very same thing. I think right. I think it's a beautiful time for all of us to to become aware and empowered. The one thing that you've said over and over through this is knowledge is power. Arm yourself with knowledge. Knowledge is power. 
I love that. And it's a consistent theme running through this. Right. Well, and you know, and there's a, you know, a kind of another step to that too, is that you can have all the knowledge and that is all the preventative aspect, you know, get in the node, you know, make decisions on what you're going to do and, and come from, from that place. But then once you have gotten to that and you've got all of that, then also let it go mm. and then come a place of knowing. Uh -huh. This is where your preparation and your training actually kicks in, that you've actually decided what you're going to do, you know what's going to happen, and then you actually do let all of it go. You're not going, oh, what's the nine things and the three things and this <laughs> thing, and you know, is my car packed? And You just let that go and you trust, and that's where you're actually going from that intuition, where it's actually more important to come from your knowing than your knowledge. That always trumps uh, wherever you're going with that. Um, but you know, when you have those basic things, they really do uh, support you and what's happening. Uh, you know, with um, you know, I used to do a lot of of training for like sororities or girls that were going from high school to college, and because it, it can be a very vulnerable time to uh, you know not think about scenarios that can happen for personal safety and things happening. And uh, a friend of mine was part of a, a collaborative effort to uh, create a video and it's actually a free resource that you can look online. It's called Just Yell Fire. Okay. And it's a video that I highly recommend that women and or their, um, their daughters, and it's actually good for, for boys as well, uh, but really gets you into that mindset are what are a few key moves, what are key, key phrases, and a way of being that will actually protect you uh, in moving through things. And, you know, one of my daughters uh, who was actually in uh, sixth grade, had a situation where there was a boy at school that was going around and was, you know, popping the bra straps and lifting up skirts and just, you know, doing a, a lot of things uh, that were, you know, inappropriate, but also, you know, that, that age frame. But mm -hmm. he was going around and we, even when girls were saying no, he was still doing that. Mm -hmm. Well, he made a point of he snapped the bra of, of my daughter and she choked him out. <laughs> and, you know... <laughs> There's a lot of people that are going to take a stance one way or the other, like, you know, that's physical violence and, you know, you should say this or whatever. But I guarantee you my daughter standing in her power of no one touches her body and that boy now going into high school and college is going to think differently of how he shows up and his behavior with other women. Yeah. Um, and so I believe that that was a teachable thing. My daughter was actually taken to, this is interesting too, was taken to the principal office and was told that she was going to be put on like suspension. And they had called me. And uh, as soon as they told me that, I was like, what did he do? I said, because my daughters are trained like only in physical, you know, uh, situations that you would actually do that. And when I heard what had happened, I said, absolutely not. I said, get her back in class. She is not going to be on suspension. I said, that is not going to be how we're going to reinforce that going on. And don't ever call me for a situation where my daughter is actually protecting herself. And I think there's something to be said for, and maybe it doesn't have to be physical, like it, it ended up being with my daughter. Maybe that was a little excessive. However, you know, uh, it's important for our daughters to have the skills because now they have the mindset. And mm -hmm. now my daughter also has that, that energy with her children where she's like, people aren't going to be messing with my kids. She shows up differently with that. And it's not from coming from a place of being a badass. You know, it's really about this is where you can actually be feminine, but also be fierce and strong and know your boundaries. And this is something I really work with a lot of my leaders on is managing your boundaries mm -hmm. of what's okay and what's not. And when you do that pre-thought, this goes back to the knowledge, when you know what you're doing, then your every day, you can just operate from knowing and you just know right away, okay, this is okay, this is not okay. And then you can maneuver that much more stronger without having to think every single thing through. And you know, I, what I'm watching people do right now, and I, it's also happening within me, is I'm, I'm being really led to to, to look at what I stand for, right? My culture, my culture, my corporate culture, my collective culture, where do I stand on a lot of the things going on out there? And I'm not looking at it through the lens of emotion. I'm looking at it through the lens of what are the facts that I'm seeing right? Not what the media is telling me or what my friends are telling me and, and creating all of this fear, but what do I actually sovereignly 
feel for myself. Yes. And, and what's happening with that is it's moving into the knowing. And I call that automaticity because once something locks over into that knowing, it's simply part of who you are. You never have to think about that because it's a knowing and it simply comes out <laughs> when somebody asks you, you know, whatever it is about that. And, right. you know, and I watch people struggle to really get the answer right about yeah. things that, that they, they clearly don't have as a foundation in a knowing place within themselves. Right. Um, and so what would you say would be the, the best way um, to move, to move something into, into clarity and true knowing within self? Oh, this is, this is such an important thing because you uh, notice when you are actually out of that, like when you're out of sync of that. And when you're out of sync with that, that's where you are looking to the media. You're listening to everything that's happening out there. It's everything that's happening outside of yourself. If you find that you are being externally referenced on everything and you're looking outside of yourself for all the different answers out there, you can gather knowledge and see there's you know always a bit of truth in everything that you hear, but you have to be able to distill that and have the discernment for that. Mm -hmm. I think the best thing that you can do is when you have all of those things, you want to make sure that you're getting into that quiet space, that you're absolutely taking those deep breaths to give yourself some clarity, that you're giving yourself that, that stillness so that you can start asking yourself some powerful questions of mm -hmm. like, okay, what's true for me? right? Where am I feeling things show up in my body? Mm. What am I being triggered to believe versus what do I know? Yes. And use some powerful writing because sometimes not all of us will actually get a sense of, of what's true for us in just that silence. Sometimes we need to write it and things will come out in just asking mm. some powerful questions there, mm -hmm. right? Um, sometimes, uh, you know, this is why you get those uh, amazing insights when you're in the shower, right? Because you're in your own environment that's away from everyone else, or if you're out walking in nature, mm -hmm. right? So when you get into different environments, and this is a way to leverage the different environments we talked about, is when you move into a different environment, you are actually able to think of things from a different perspective. And then you're able to allow yourself to then become from that grounded space to then start determining what are the truths for you. So you could actually start, you know, either on, you know, your phone or, or in a journal, what are some universal truths that you know are true for you? Mm -hmm. And just welcome for them to come in the middle of the night, when you're on a walk, when you're in the shower, at this most weird opportune times, you could be listening to us right now. And all of a sudden something comes to you and go, that's true for me. Mm -hmm. Right. And when you start recognizing those, those start building upon each other. And mm -hmm. that's where you start building your knowingness. And so it's really like a muscle that you just keep, right? You keep working yes. uh, and it just gets stronger and stronger. Yes, absolutely. And when you notice that you are second guessing yourself, right? That you're not listening to your truth. You need to actually have even more time where you're in that place of silence and you start asking yourself, why am I not listening to myself? Right. And that second guessing that comes along so often, doesn't it? Um, and, and this is, this is what I believe is happening right now is we're offering ourselves an opportunity for stillness to know what we stand for, what we will stand up for, right. And what we won't stand. Absolutely. Um, and, and it is in that stillness. I, I laugh because I always get stuff in the shower and at the sink when I'm, when I'm washing the dishes so, yeah. and the garbage can, and I don't get the garbage can, but, but it's. <laughs> It's clearly because I'm I'm still in my environment, right? Right, right. Well, but you know what? It's a transfer, right? So <laughs> when you're actually moving something into something else, that you within your system is going, okay, I'm going from a way of being here to shift into a different way of being, or I am emptying out things that are not working for me. You know, you're showering and rinsing off the day that's not me. Right. So all the things that we do when you're walking, you know, movement allows you to access different areas of your brain. Right. It's all activating different parts of yourself so that you can now 
see and witness yourself in a different way so that you can see what are the consistencies that show up what is consistently you versus mm -hmm. what are the things that you're like acting out of fear or, you know, one thing I learned really early on in the police department is just because it's on the news doesn't mean it's true. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot just Thank tell you, you that. How, yes. <laughs> how much frustration that would happen when I would be at a scene and then I would go home and turn on the news and they would have just a clip of what I said, which is mm. completely out of context. <laughs> what had happened was completely what did not happen. And so we got to realize anything that we hear, whether it's from, you know, the authorities of, you know, medical people or politics or, you know, anything that's out there in the media that we are accessing our knowing because how many times have we heard something and I'll just be like, that's not true. Like, I know that that is not true. And we are so programmed to just believe what is being, you know, put in front of us that we really do have to exercise that discernment and see what things are actually true for us. Because, you know, we also have to look at who's behind all the different things that are happening. Who owns those companies? Who are making decisions? You know, who is affecting us? And really just start coming from a, a more informed place so that we know where we stand with mm -hmm. those different things, you know? And are these things making us stronger? Are they taking our rights away? How's this show up? You know, it's not about being affiliated with certain organizations, about where do where do you, you know end up in all of that? Where mm -hmm. is that? What's important in that for you and your family and your community and the people you lead when you can allow yourself to get outside of those things and get mm -hmm. really clear on where you are, you will always have more power because it's coming with women within you and you're not looking at the power outside of you, which is false power. And so I'm going to ask the same question I asked before in a different way. So I watch people do this and I watch them say, I'm informing myself, I'm a researcher, I've got all the science and they're still creating separatist agendas, right? Adding to what is the control that they're, that they're saying they don't want to have put upon them. So, so same thing as the victim question, how do we, how do we distinguish that that truth is it the soft stillness that comes with it as opposed to the to the fighting combative kind of um you know posture that's taken how do we know right well i believe that that is becomes like a multi-prong approach right so you take whatever information because so everything's input right everything comes at you and it's how we respond to that what we do with that you know how is it that a situation can happen and one person can completely crumble and they can't react and they're paralyzed and another person goes got it and moves through it yeah. right those are very different uh, ways of responding to something. And both of them can shift and change in a moment by how they look at it. So mm -hmm. whatever information's coming, you can do the, the knowledge, the research part of it. Just don't get obsessive in it where you are looking at it from, you know, the actual letter of the law. You also have to look at the spirit of the law and what's uh, underneath that. Yeah. So you always want to look at what's underneath any of the information that is being given. Okay. If I'm being told that I need to act in a certain way regarding my health, I look at who's telling me that. What do they have to gain by telling me that? Are they going to financially benefit from that? Is it going to be how uh, I'm going to have to operate differently in the world? Who's behind that? And then who's behind that? So mm -hmm. when you start kind of, you know, following the lead, you're, you're, you're all becoming classic detectives where you go like, <laughs> what's the next clue? So you just follow the clues and then you look at, okay, now that I have the knowledge part handled, now I'm going into stillness. And now out of that, out of stillness, we distill what is actually for us. And so from that, we can then decide what's in alignment with us. What do we know about that? How am I going to operate from that? And then you go from that. And that's where you then release all of the knowledge and you only operate at that point from knowing because you've already done your homework in the knowledge part. Oh, that's fabulous. I, I tell you, your, your years on the force have certainly um, provided wisdom and you've given us such a big gift. This is, this is one of the most, um, I think, timely conversations that all of us can be having right now is really getting very clear. And then from that clarity, simply allowing it to inform the way we live our lives. 
and not we don't need to talk about it at that point. And that's what's so interesting to me is when you know I, I often joke and say that when people are talking about enlightenment, they they uh, definitely haven't experienced it because they're still talking about it, and it's and it's the same kind of thing with this. I think when when there's a knowing within oneself. There, there is no need to talk about it un, unless it's part of your mission. And I, and I think a lot of missions are going to come out of this time that we're in. Um, you know, we certainly would like to see all of our systems better prepared to serve us, um, you know, in, in a more ideal way. So, right. wow. Well, I also think it's important, too, is that uh, this is again, that being, you know, responsible for yourself is to, you know, you'll hear if you listen too much to the news and everything that, you know, the, the hospitals are full and there's not resources and who's going to save us and, and all of those type of things. Well, that is also the conversation to be, what are you going to do to save yourself? Right. Yes. You know, if you know how to take care of your own health, if you know how to fortify your immune system, you don't need all of those systems, right? You come from that place of knowing you want to look at all the different areas of your life. You don't have to be worried about those things. And so, you know, it's also a great time. You know, this is this is something I believe that we're going to look back on and either people are going to be like, that was the worst time that ever happened. Yeah. And there's also going to be other people that are going to say, you know what, this was the best time. How many times do people say, oh, I wish I had more time. I wish I could be more with my family. Well, yes. here it is, folks. Yes. You know, it's right here in front of you. What are the conversations that you are having with your children, mm -hmm. with the people that you love, with your closest friends? I mean, I've been doing something, you know, with uh, we've got a, a family group chat, uh, you know, with my kids and my sister and my parents and everybody in there. And I've been putting uh, I have like these little cards and I've been just throwing out things every day, just kind of things to, to think about. And they've been fun things like I put on there, like if you could be. Uh, if you could be any ice cream in the world, what would you be and why? You know, and we've had this just these funny things that people are saying, like, oh, I would be cookie dough because I'm half baked, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah. my sister's like, I'll be vanilla because I'm reliable and dependable, you know? Oh, and it's nice. just, but it's just these yeah. fun conversations that we don't allow ourselves the space to just, mm -hmm. you know, to get to know each other on that next level. And, you know, it doesn't always have to be like, what is the strategy that's going to happen? It could mm -hmm. be like, how is it that we can make the most of this time? Yeah. And that is something, you know, in the spaces of knowingness, if we looked at, hey, if time and money isn't an issue, which is we're kind of, you know, I this know. global reset that's happening. Yes. What would you be doing? What's the conversations you would be having? How would you be living your life? I mean, there's been nights where, you know, Carrie and I have been like, well, it's not a school night. Let's watch a movie. <laughs> <laughs> You know, just for fun, right? Just for fun. Yeah. So, you know, it's just seeing people walking and being out more and just shifting their what is actually important. This is such a pivotal time in history where we actually get to be part of the global research source to reset ourselves to be able to say, how do I want to operate going forward? Oh, yes. It, and it is such a gift. And I invite you all to... Um, take the gift. And, um, what, what does it say they, in the matrix? You take, you take the red pill, the red pill or the blue pill, which one pick, <laughs> just pick and be okay with what you pick because you can always pick again, right? Well, <laughs> you know, sometimes you can't pick again. Can you, Oh, um, Diane, you are amazing. This is Diane's website, dianehaffman.com. And I'm going to have uh, all of the ways to contact her in the show notes. She also is gifting us, um, five moves to reset your power. It's, it's one of her modules. And so if you'll go, um, here it, to the website, you can take, take, I, I see more advantage of your wisdom. I, I have so enjoyed this and I really hope I can get you to come back in a couple of weeks and we'll, we'll design a little, um, complex systems epigenetics, look at a few things because, Man, we could we could really um, open lots of windows of perception through through conversations like this. Um, super grateful. It. Yeah, my <laughs> pleasure. I think these are the most important conversations to have right now. Is just like, what is your way of being going to be? <laughs> yes, choose. Please choose on purpose, not through victim consciousness. Right. Or if you you know whatever works for you. All right. Thank you, Diane. Happy day uh, to you. Love my everybody. Pleasure. Uh, <laughs>